Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with host Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Search for us on your favorite podcast app, or you can find the podcast on jimmyhinton.org and findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so we can spread the word. If you would like to support us and get exclusive rewards, go to patreon.com slash speaking out. Find the tier that best fits you and join as a patron of the podcast. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast with host Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. And as always, thank you to our patrons who help support our podcast and give us constant messages of encouragement. Uh, We do sincerely thank you for that. Um, We look forward to your encouragement all the time. We do. We enjoy it. Uh, so hopefully you guys got to listen to the last two episodes with, uh, Dominic and Megan Benninger. Um, they have the website, um, baptistaccountability.org. Uh, it's the, it's the only database. Well, I shouldn't say only, um, the Houston Chronicle had a database that they started, uh, when they did their investigative article, uh, back, when was that? Last year? 2019? Even my years blend together. I don't I even know what day say, of the week it is. I, <laughs> let alone yet, what year. You, you got it, Jimmy. <laughs> it's uh, Life is a Blur. But yeah. at any rate, um, yeah, the Houston Chronicle had um, has um, a database based on that uh, article that they had written. They uncovered like... 700 victims, I forget how many Mm -hmm. Baptist predators, Uh, but um, the Benningers have an ongoing website that they constantly maintain, and and they add uh, predators to that routinely. And right now, um, it's just sexual abuse. Uh, And I think that includes sexual abuse of both minors and adults. Um. But the, the, as of yesterday, there were 498 individuals on that website. That, that's like hard to believe. And I would encourage people to go visit that website to get a feel for what, what's there, um, to get a feel for what that couple is doing. It's so helpful. It, it is. And it's enlightening. I, I think it just opens our eyes to a, another whole view of what abuse, you know, what happens within churches with abuse. Yeah, I mean, I, I think survivors know that really well, but I think the the really big benefit in websites like this is that it informs it informs mm-hmm. average members where I feel like advocates so often are, are caught in the cycle of constantly having to uh, explain to people right. why – why we should be passionate about Mm -hmm. protecting innocent people from predators. And, you know, there's just kind of this mindset that, well, you know, aren't they, aren't they the same as the rest of us? You know, we all struggle with sin and what makes them different. Why would you call them out publicly? And why would you put them on a website when, you know, grandma's sitting three rows back and she's a gossip um, kind Mm -hmm. of thing. So uh, we, we wanted to share, One of the stories, just one of the 498 that are on this website, and literally, uh, you can click through just random people on this website, and you're going to get very similar stories to this. So this is one, um, this is an article that was first published March 4th of 2012. Uh, The title of the article is this. Um... Accused as molester, Daniel Acker Jr. was once beloved Shelby County teacher. This is in Alabama. So this guy was a youth minister, a school teacher. um, And then after his allegations came forward and uh, the community rallied around him, he took up being a bus driver too. Because it wasn't just enough to be a school teacher and a youth minister. He had to drive school bus too. So here's just a couple paragraphs. Uh, when school teacher Daniel Acker Jr. in 1992 was accused of molesting a child, 
Churches, teachers, schools, and parents rallied to his aid. They held pancake dinners to raise money for his defense, proclaimed his innocence on marquees, demonized the fourth grader who accused Acker Jr. of touching her breast, and voted him, in the wake of the allegations, Teacher of the Year. Shelby County circled the wagons to fight for its own, and won. Last week, again, this is uh, in 2012, last week, nearly two months after police say Acker Jr. admitted to groping little girls on at least 20 occasions, including the child involved in the 1992 allegations, a Shelby County grand jury heard charges against the now-retired elementary teacher. Officials expected to learn this week whether the grand jury returned any indictments. Uh, And now, around the county, preachers, family, friends, and former co-workers at the schools are all mum. Silence. So, they're out there rallying, they're you know they're showing up at the school board they're um they're giving their uh testimony about this guy what a wonderful man he is people from both the church and his school and meanwhile there was a little what fourth or fifth grader that he was constantly molesting and harassing and tormenting and when she reported it she reported it right away which is incredibly rare uh, for a child to do that i th- i think we have to understand how frightening that is. This is her teacher. This is a beloved this is, youth I was going to say, this is her teacher that everybody loved. It wasn't yeah. like some gross, um, nasty person. This is somebody who everybody adored. Yeah. So she stood up. She The courage that that little girl had is amazing. Mm-hmm. Totally amazing. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, what happened for this girl is that her both her classmates and her teachers started to bully her and you know they would they would threaten her they would uh, they would ridicule her they would ask her why she would make up these lies about about her teacher um and on and on and on and on she had the entire community literally pitted against her a little fourth or fifth grade girl let me see what grade she was in i don't remember it was either fourth or fifth um I'll read on a little bit. I mean, I I think it's important just for some of this context. Uh, Acker's parents, County Commissioner Daniel Acker Sr. and Judy Acker, say their lawyer advised them not to talk. So his own dad is a county commissioner. Uh, I think, well, Jimmy, throughout the article, and it's quite a lengthy article, throughout the article is mentioned time and time again what an upstanding family this is mm-hmm. and Daniel Acker senior is you know very involved in the community um the family is beloved you know by all they've been involved in so many uh, wonderful things including missions by the way um and it went on and on and on as though there could never be this kind of wrong done within this family yeah crazy it is uh, and it's routine i it mean is. this happens yes. all the time right um acker jr's wife andrea apologized for her silence but said she couldn't comment uh which is understandable i i don't want to knock her um i think for her you know again this this was written in 2012 it was shortly after he was arrested um she was in a really tough spot i'm sure mom you were not I was willing to say, talk to the no, media no, immediately after dad's arrest. Not at all. And you have all kinds of layers of um, feelings going on there. And you also have a protective measure as mother of your family, uh, the other members of your family. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure her mind was just going crazy at this point. Yeah. So I, I totally get it. But for the other people, there's no excuse. No, not Um, at all. This next sentence, when asked to do an interview, his preacher at at Dominion Baptist Church, the Reverend Mark Little said, I have nothing Mm -hmm. to say. And what I have to say is shame on you. Mm -hmm. Uh, He should have said, I'll step up to the microphone and I will publicly repent for standing by this man's side, for believing him over the victim. Um, 
I publicly apologize that we got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And we have nothing to do with abuse. We don't stand for anything that this man did. Um, and we repent and dust and ashes. That would have been a proper response. Um, Acker Jr. himself has not responded from his Shelby County jail cell to interview requests via mail and email. Um, Shelby County judges have also backed away from Acker Jr.'s case, saying they wanted to avoid the appearance of impropriety with Acker Jr.'s father being a county commissioner. Nonsense. Right. There we go again. And like like we both said, time and time again, references made to the father, it's almost like they were afraid to do something for fear of offending the father. Did you pick up? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I get. Yeah. You know, let's not offend his dad. Yeah. Um, some say the reluctance by residents and teachers to talk is out of respect for the Acker family. What about out of respect for the victims? Right. Um, it's a close, close knit community, said Norma Rogers, the former Shelby County School Superintendent, who pushed for Acker Jr.'s firing in 1993 after the allegation. I just don't think they want to hurt the family any more than the damage that has already been done. You can't always judge children by their parents. Well, she's right about that. Mm -hmm. um, you can't always judge parents by what their children do, Rogers said. I feel for Acker Jr.'s parents, and I also feel for the children who've been abused. Um, for the few who will speak out about Acker Jr., they said it's hard for them to reconcile the fun-loving popular teacher with a man who police say confessed to molesting students. Uh, there was no hint no sign of any problem, said the Reverend Gary Ashley, Acker Jr.'s former pastor at Westwood Baptist Church, where Acker was a youth minister. How about the fact that he had allegations against him? Right. I mean, there were no signs whatsoever. <laughs> uh, no hints, no problems. Clear back Nothing in 1992, on. this is now 2012, when this um, conversation is going on. Think of the years of molesting that he did. Yeah. During that period of time. I know. Well, yeah. and I mean, look at this. The guy, he got to retire as a yeah. school teacher. Yep. Yes. The first allegation was 1992. This is now 2012. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is unbelievable. For 20 years, this guy yep. was able to continue on. He's teacher of the year, remember? And that, that happened. horrible? And that happened in the middle of yes. the, these allegations, yes. when this little girl came forward, they voted him Teacher of the Year back in 92 or whenever that was. We had um, a, a case like this, Jimmy. I'll talk to you about it privately after this. But when one of your sisters applied for a job teaching, she did not get it. Teacher of the Year, former Teacher of the Year got it. Interestingly, midway through the school year, he was fired because of he he was molesting children. Yeah, and and I don't know how the school board found out, but he came with accolades and you know with his certificate of being this awesome teacher. Uh, and who knows what happened during his stay here? You know. Well, I mean, I think I think the the strong point that we want to make is in follow up to our interview with the Benningers, this is why databases are right. essential. Absolutely. It's not, like, yeah. it's not like we should have them, that it's a good mm -hmm. idea that, you know, eh, if people want to look it up, you know, if they want to be bothered to spend five minutes. I mean, I literally found this guy in 30 seconds of right. landing on this website, right. um, Baptist Accountability baptistaccountability.org. You know, it's not that we should have them, um, that, you know, we should have a debate about this. We should have a discussion and, and weigh the benefits versus not having one of these websites. No, we mm -hmm. have to have what, these websites. Well, what a blessing this these websites are. What a blessing this website is. Um, just think when people, th this man skipped from teacher to youth pastor to bus driver. That, you know, well, he all, was doing them all simultaneously oh, yeah. at oh, the same oh, time. Absolutely. Yeah. Where he had full access to children. Uh, had there been something like that website available and had there been people who actually used it, these websites are uh, worthless if people yeah. are not using them. Yeah. And, and they're, 
you know, couples like we interviewed, they're not being tattletales. They're not out there dragging people through the dirt as we sometimes hear. They're out there showing people the truth. And they're and warning. They're they're warning, warning people. people. I mean, that's the whole purpose. These are your is- children. As a parent, we have responsibilities to protect our children. Yeah. We didn't have resources like this available. When you kids were growing up, heaven forbid, I didn't even know about abuse. You know, that it now, this is common knowledge. Now we have resources. Let's use them. Yeah. Well, the frustrating thing is when when these resources are available and people either don't use them or or they throw sticks at the people who create them. And, you know, the Benningers, they shared their story. Mm -hmm. And this was not something that they had support. For. No, it was the, very the, sad to the hear church, them talking. Yes. The church was very angry mm-hmm. at them for starting this. Yeah. Why would you stir this up? Why mm-hmm. he abused he abused these kids back in the past. Why would you why would you bring it up now? Um and if you remember about that story, and I know I know the story well because I consulted with their church. Mm-hmm. Um so I I know this story well. I know the Benninger story well. Um Don Foos, who had a history of sexual abuse, was arrested. He was convicted um, years ago for child molestation. Also had current allegations. When they contacted me, they contacted me. I am just shaking my head. He had current allegations of sexual misconduct mm -hmm. with um, a a disabled, barely adult. Um, Those are current, uh, reportable allegations right so it's it's not like well this was in the past and why would you bring it up it's this guy had his license i'm talking about don foos now in pennsylvania right, right, right had his teaching license permanently revoked by the state because they said you are not safe to be around children ever again um and yet the church when the benningers started their website in mm. february of this year they were livid Mm-hmm. Um, they got doxxed. The Benningers got doxxed. People published their personal address and cell phone numbers on on the internet. It's ter- it, it um, is so wrong. What what is going on yet? And I I know you and I have discussed it many times. I don't get it. I don't get where people's I, hearts I never and will minds get it. are. I do not get it. If you know that um in the yard your your children are there. And they're playing, and there is a lion that is loose. And somebody calls you and said, hey, there's a lion in the yard with your kids. Are you going to just sit back and say, oh, it's, you know, he's never hurt anybody before that I know of? Or, yeah. hey, he hurt, he, he killed somebody back 20 years ago, but my kids are okay. No, we wouldn't do that. Right. Uh, of course not. But yeah. yet we do it with these predators and with our own kids. Yeah, yeah, that's that. that I that's do the not very confusing get it. Part. I do not get it. No. So I want to share with the last little bit that we have here. Um, I'll I'll put a little trigger warning in here uh, for any survivors who are listening. But this is a letter that my dad had written um, years ago. Um, oh, this was probably 2013 or so. Um, so that would be about a year after his sentencing. Yeah. He that, was sentenced yes. in 2012, right? right? June okay. of June of 2012. Right. Uh, so this is probably the next year. Uh, this was in response to me writing a blog that he got his grubby little hands on. Um, I'd written a blog about the importance of church leaders not allowing convicted sex offenders back into the church who've raped little children. Um, So the first part of this was really scathing. I'm going to skip that. Um, I actually read this for some of our patrons and an an exclusive. If you sign up and become a patron, um, you will get access to that exclusive podcast where I read a big section of this letter. Uh, Or maybe that was in one of our Q and A's at any rate. You can access that if you become a patron. Just a little selfless plug there. Um, okay. So here he says in this letter, he, he was really aggravated that um, I would even hint that we separate 
sex offenders from the church. But then he starts talking about about the importance of reintegrating them back into the church and reconciling them to the victim's family. So he says here, you mentioned of victims and the church's responsibility to them. Let's say I got out of prison this year and wanted to return to worship and work with the Somerset Church of Christ. Uh, That's where I preach, by the way. This would be an event that should immediately trigger an emergency elders meeting, followed by a second with me, the sex offender. I should be told in no uncertain terms that it is crazy for me to be so insensitive to the victims and their family without sitting down with mediators uh, present with the parents and openly asking about their forgiveness, and then their being or not being perfectly okay with my coming back. So again, this is in the context of him saying... Suppose I got out of prison and I say, I want to worship and work with the church. And his his reasoning for that being a red flag for the leaders is because we didn't have a mediator present where we put the offender with the victims and their families in the same room together. Like he's saying, you should have. You should have put me with my victims and their family first. He's also saying He's something that blows me away um, to see where they are about forgiveness. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a huge theme that throughout just this whole blows letter. Blows me away. Um. So then he says, if there's if there's any resistance from that family, I would think it's a no brainer. Such a return is not going to happen. And I need to find a new church home. Okay, let's pause for a second. Because some of you might be thinking, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't, you know, okay, granted, he's going on to another church where he's free to reinvent himself, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, at least he has the brains to say, you know, you should you should remove me. That's not going to happen. You shouldn't even be here. All right. You know where my mind went before I even read the next sentence? When I I still remember getting this letter. I remember very clearly. Where my mind went next is this is not a permanent removal from the church. This is him saying, yeah, absolutely. You shouldn't be there at church. Uh, um, quote, unquote, for now. Mm-hmm. Right? So listen to where listen to where this letter goes. Then, I believe after a cooling off period, the elders should meet again with the family and talk in earnest, that is the family of the victims, and talk in earnest about the issue of a resolution with a possible short trial period of restored fellowship. In other words, this forced merger where we bring the sex offender back into the church. And he's using himself as an example. <laughs> if- and he just says, let's try it out. If, you let's know, just try it. Let, let's, let's force let's, the victim's right. family. Let's give it a try. They were totally against it to begin with because the pain and hurt is so big yet. So after and, a cooling off period. Yeah, after a few weeks or a couple months of cooling off, let's give this a whirl again. Yeah. Bring mm-hmm. bring them in front of elders to intimidate right. them um, and talk to them about resolution. He says, if there is still great unrest and resistance, drop it and accept what is. However, Mm -hmm. there's always a however, isn't there? Right. Yep. Okay. So he can't, offenders, listen to this. I'm going to speak in it. I'm going to, I'm going to hold the microphone and speak directly into it for dramatic effect. Listen to this. There is always a how, a however with offenders. They can never just drop things and accept what it is. They will never just drop things and accept what is. So let me reread this. If there's still great unrest and resistance, drop it and accept what is. However, what a wonderful opportunity to teach slash preach and lead by example of total restoration via forgiveness and undeserved grace for the family, victims, and church body. That is the very moment when that church will explode with growth, because now it has modeled genuine Christ-like living from top to bottom, 
and every sinner from within and without would know and be able to see firsthand 100% of the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his plan for a kingdom where every citizen can experience wholeness for their broken hearts, a restoration of hope, and a future with great possibilities and blessings. I'm tearing up over here. You know, that is <laughs> this such... This is bull crap. Those are such dead words to me, Jimmy. They are dead. They are just dead words. It It's a mimic that's used over and over and over again by abusers. And it really makes me nauseous. And listen where he's placing the the responsibility. If if you guys do this as he bats his eyelashes, if you do this, it'll make Mm. you look like you're the good Christians that you ought to be. Right. Um, And then I like this. And since this has become a very long pouring out of my heart, I'll save my thoughts on the church's responsibility to victims for another day. <laughs> if <laughs> I forget, remind me, really? So I wrote some notes with this because wow. this is important for context. And, you know, if if you just took this letter just by itself, you'd be like, all right, Jimmy, maybe you're being a little bit hard on your dad because, you know – You know a lot about sex offenders, and you know how they think, and they're always trying to worm their way back into church. But what if he legitimately was um, sincere in this letter that he wrote to you? All right, let me write this this little uh, context that I wrote. So I wrote this just to jog my, my memory so that I would never forget. I wrote this. This letter was a response to an article that I had written on what what place pedophiles have in the church. It can be accessed here, and then I'll link to my own article. This letter is full of manipulative language that the average person falls for. It's important to note that I preach where he did for 27 years. He was producing victims in my congregation up to the day of his arrest. One of those young victims recently came and spoke with, spoke with me to tell me that she can no longer worship in our building because of the trauma that it causes her. By the way, she's spoken publicly about this, so I'm not betraying any right. confidence here. Yes. Um, and I'm not going to mention her name because no. that's that's irrelevant. Um, and I, I wouldn't I just wouldn't do that. So I said she suffers from panic attacks and flashbacks when she enters the building. His abuse was violent. It was often. He abused this young girl in her own home. She suffers from PTSD and severe insomnia because she fears her own nightmares of my dad. Context is vital. At the time he wrote this letter, he was demanding that we all send him photos of our young children. He wrote the father of the victims he was charged with asking for pictures of his daughters. My dad produced extremely graphic child pornography with those very young girls. He was also writing love letters to these same young victims, which the father intercepted. Thank God. Right. Mm -hmm. The incarcerated sex offenders in PA are not allowed any pictures of minor children. The penalties are very stiff for receiving quote-unquote contraband. That's what they call it. Uh, If sex offenders are caught with any pictures of any minors, including if they take a magazine with a picture of a kid fully dressed and they cut that picture out and put that in their cell, that's considered contraband. My dad was asking for pictures of his victims from their own father. So I said, yet he persisted. He began writing my church members letters, asking them to go to certain family members to collect and send photos of their young children. Fortunately, none of them did so. So I told him to go pound dirt when he was asking for pictures of my kids. Um, he, he was individually asking my brothers and sisters for photographs of their kids to send to prison. All of them said no. So then he started contacting my church members. From prison. He was writing letters to individual church members of mine to ask not for pictures of my kids because he knew that he'd be in deep doo-doo, but he would send or attempted to send my church members to other siblings of mine to ask for photographs of their kids to send to my... Do you see how manipulative... He's doing this while he wrote this stupid letter to me. About reintegrating himself back in... It's just the right thing to do. What a wonderful example this would show that you're being so loving 
And you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. That's why I say I use the word dead. The words he wrote are dead. They are dead. They are meaningless because what comes from his heart is he's craving if if he could just even get pictures of these children before him. He went to great lengths to try to get photographs. At at risking himself being caught with contraband. Knowing that he would be put in solitary confinement for for having contraband. Didn't care. That's how hard the drive was. He was, and and your word, Jimmy, I loved how you said, there is always a however. They Mm -hmm. don't stop. They chisel Uh -uh. and chisel and chisel and chisel and keep it, keep at it until they get what they want. Yeah. Yeah. The more I, I mean, the more, the more I look at websites like the, the database that the Benningers have, Mm -hmm. um, baptistaccountability.org, uh, the more letters I get from my dad from prison, uh, the more I consult with churches, the more I do trainings with churches, the more I speak in the last uh, what is it? Nine years. Yes. In the last mm-hmm. nine years, the more I speak, the harder the stance I take that sex right. offenders do not belong in church, around church, near church, in people's homes, mm-hmm. or anywhere near any minor children. Period. Ever. You you've seen the pattern. You see it time after time after time again. They don't stop. No. Period. Period. So now that we got y'all riled up, yeah. <laughs> yes, but we should, right? Like the, the we should, we, yes, we should be listening to when I talk about predators with my friends, and I use that term pretty loosely now, um, who are in ministry, who I went to seminary with, um, I either get dead silence or I get lambasted, mm-hmm. and they're like. Aren't you being overreactive? And and I don't ta- I don't even talk this way yeah. with my friends. Usually I'm I'm like you know with the podcast I can let loose a little bit. Um, we, we want we you know, to. <laughs> we know our audience. Yeah, exactly um, right. But um, you know when I when I write in groups with minister friends of mine, I'm I'm like guys, just please vet people. Like mm-hmm. just start with vetting people. Mm-hmm. Oh, aren't you being overreactive? And I like, you don't believe in forgiveness and all this weird stuff. And I'm like, we are dooming our children. We are, we are cursing them to be abused when we take sex offenders in and and we're just like, well, shouldn't we treat them like everybody else? No, we shouldn't. When we watch a child of ours suffer with PTSD, with nightmares, with trauma, with severe anxiety, with depression, with suicidal thoughts, Mm -hmm. because of their abuse, God forbid that we don't vet. God forbid that we don't use websites like is are available. God forbid that we don't seek and search who is spending time with our children. And I mean that. I mean that so much. We're not warning people um because we're we're looking for Something somewhere in no, their past that, no. you know, it, it's like politics where maybe we can find some no. dirt on them somewhere. That's not what this is. No. These are people who repeatedly, um, constantly, serially abused children and, and adults in the most vile, severe ways over and over and over again, unapologetically, while this scumbag... Uh, this um, Acker guy Mm -hmm. accepted the teacher of the year award. It's not like they just voted for it. He, he got up there knowing Mm -hmm. that victim was in his class, knowing that his victim was being intimidated and bullied by teachers and students. And the guy goes up there and smiles and accepts the teacher of the year award. I cannot imagine the harm that was done to that little girl. That, you know, what? what's she thinking about right. those who are supposed to protect her? What does yeah. she think about that? Yeah, we, we need to stop apologizing for mm. warning people about credibly accused um, predators. I mean, because that's what they are. They're predators. Right. 
Um, they don't stop. They won't stop. They're unapologetic. They they will worm their way in any way that they can, and they'll do it right in front of the victims. And look at how my dad talked about the victim, mm -hmm. like forcing this reconciliation. You want to talk about humiliation? You want to talk about fear and intimidation? Can you imagine these victims being forced with a mediator to face their abuser who just got out of prison? It's horrible. It, it, <laughs> it is. I can't even think That's about where his it. mind get, is, though. I know. I get physically ill thinking about it. I do. Yeah. So here's your truth bomb for the day. Don't fall for predator sob stories or get sucked into Bible discussions. They have lost the credibility to teach Bible lessons when they raped kids. Amen. They have no credibility. Right. Tell them to shut their Bible and go take it with them and leave you alone. Don't fall for it. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and we will catch you next episode. Thanks again for listening to today's episode. Thank you to our patrons who make the podcast possible. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker and search for the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to hit subscribe and rate the show. If you believe in what we do, consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the cool rewards our patrons receive. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.